Cherub's J.M.W. Turner has a reputation for being the greatest English painter who ever lived. He filled his canvases with this kind of dynamic energy and emotion and famously light. He seemed to paint like a poet. He paints moments, but those moments introduce themes. They explore the relationship of the past to the present, or the tension between technology and nature. And then his compositions complicate those explorations. He'll give us a painting of industrial England with a train ripping through the English countryside, showing us mankind's ability to outpace nature, showing us how exciting and epic technology can be. But he also shows that train staining the English countryside, introducing black smoke into the pastoral setting. Trains are exciting and terrifying, this seems to tell us. They're going to change the world and the way that we live in it, and there is a great opportunity there. But there's also a real danger. We're going to lose some parts of ourselves, our environments, and our communities in that process. Both of those feelings are valid responses to the introduction of the train. Hope and fear, excitement and anxiety, they both can exist at the same time, and Turner lets us live in that complicated space. There's ambiguity and honesty in these images. They don't turn away from the complexity. They try to illustrate it. It would be really cool if I made a video about the famous painting Rain, Steam, and Speed, or the Fighting Temeraire, which was declared England's best painting a few years ago, or Kielman heaving in coals by night is really beautiful. That would make a really good video. Or that one about the snowstorm. That one, every time I see it, it blows my hair back. And yeah, I've made a couple videos about some of those, and they're old ones, and they're not very good videos, but maybe I'll remake them sometime. But those beautiful and famous paintings by Turner, that's, that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Today, I'm going to continue my long tradition of writing about art that nobody searches for. Today, I'm writing about Turner's painting, Plowing Up Turnips Near Slough. That's right, a painting about some people plowing turnips. It might not have the visual punch of the Temeraire, but I promise you, this painting, just as those others, reads like a poem if you give it your attention. It has that same unflinching gaze of his images of a train, but rather than use a dynamic new technology as his central image, he's using a bunch of turnips, and I think it's brilliant. So if this sounds like it's your type of thing, giving artwork your attention and letting it work its magic on you, then please consider subscribing, and with that, Let's take a closer look at J.M.W. Turner's painting, Plowing Up Turnips Near Slough. So first, to understand this painting, you need to understand turnips. They're a root vegetable, like potato or beets or radishes, but they're not as good as those. You can buy them at the grocery store if you want, I guess, but for me, and I think most of us living in the 21st century, Turnips don't carry a lot of meaning, like they don't have symbolic value. Turnips don't have any strong connotations attached to them. I don't associate them with any cuisine in particular or any famous dishes or rituals. What I'm getting at here is that there are plenty of foods that have strong connotative meaning. If certain food products appear in a painting, I might see some sort of symbolic value in them. Apples might evoke the Garden of Eden, or grapes might hint at a mass or a bacchanalia. Coconuts might help me locate the image in a particular setting. Produce can come loaded with meaning, but for me, standing here in the 21st century, turnips don't have that. I can't remember the last time I ate one or even saw one. They're essentially invisible to me. They're meaningless. But 200 years ago, in England, that was not the case. Turnips come loaded with meaning in the early 19th century. Specifically, they represent a new kind of farming, a progressive form of agriculture, and a changing English landscape. So to understand the implications of this new agriculture, first we need to rewind a little bit, let's say to the 16th century. At that time, villages in England had a bit of common land at the center of the town. That land would be divided into long rows and people could grow food on this land. If you were lucky enough to have livestock, you could graze that livestock on this land. Additionally, there would be parts of this land that people could just go on to and collect firewood or forage for other resources. And this is to say that people who didn't own land themselves could still subsistence farm to some degree. 
In a larger sense, the village itself could subsistence farm and provide food for itself. Production could be localized. And this open field system required a lot of negotiation and conversation between the people who used it. Sometimes a bit of land needs to be kept farrow or held without crops for a season in order to restore the soil to health. In that case, it's totally fine for somebody to, for example, graze their livestock on that field and let animals naturally fertilize the land. But livestock shouldn't be grazing where everybody has their crops growing. The animals would eat all the food. So there needs to be a constant collaboration and communication. Use of the land needs to be negotiated constantly between people in the village. Obviously, this process has a lot of inefficiencies. This system requires a lot of sitting around and talking and compromising and collaborating. The land under this system is never going to be as productive as it could possibly be. It might build strong communities, it might be democratic, but it's not rational. And the 18th century Enlightenment England is all about rationality and efficiency. So in that time, let's say between 1600 and 1800, these common lands slowly become enclosed. There were innovations in transportation technology and agriculture, and these innovations meant that the landowning class could make more money if they removed the people from the commons and managed the fields unilaterally, without any negotiation. These commons became private property, with landowners making all of the decisions for everybody. And this move towards privatization, it's a slow process, over hundreds of years but it speeds up significantly in the 1760s or so. And this shift from accessible commons and an open field system to fenced in or hedged in land, it's called the enclosure movements in England. And these enclosure movements allow the land to become much more efficient. The landowner can make a decision about how the land will be used without consulting anyone at all. Rather than focus on subsistence for the village, a landowner could now specialize in certain types of crop production and sell to other villages in exchange for different types of produce. This shift in agricultural production has a huge impact on English life and the English landscape, and English landscape paintings. It changes the way that food is produced, obviously, but it also changes relationships of labor. Instead of working the land to grow their own food, people work the land for wages. They don't own the food that they're growing, they own their labor, which is exchanged for money. Hopefully, enough money to be able to buy that food. As part of this transition, or I guess more accurately, alongside this transition, landowners began doing experiments with agricultural production on their land. Without the need to get approval from everybody in the village, they could just run the experiments themselves and learn how to get the most out of their land. It was all very scientific, very enlightened, and one particularly popular method that arose during this time of experimentation was called the Norfolk Four Course Rotation. This system splits a field into four parts and rotates the types of crops on those four parts. By using this system, the landowner would never need to keep a field fallow anymore, so land could be used to its full potential. And a necessary crop within this system, the key to making this whole rotation work, is the turnip. They could be grown during the winter. The roots go deeper than many other crops, so they can take advantage of nutrients in the soil that other crops can't. And you can plow up the turnips, and you can just like leave them right there and have the livestock eat them right on the field, which permits the livestock to poop all over the place, and that fertilizes the land so that crops can thrive there in the following seasons. So the turnip, more than any other crop in England, is associated with this sort of progressive, innovative agriculture. They're associated with the enclosure movements generally, and with rational, efficient production. But back in the early 19th century, nobody wants to eat turnips. This means they're also associated with hunger. For example, according to Michelle L. Miller, during the famine of 1799 to 1800, a rural clergyman recorded the food his parishioners used to augment their diets when bread was unobtainable. Turnips were a last resort. Turnips were viewed as animal food, good for cows, but not for people. They're the last resort of the starving. So you see, turnips have no meaning for us, but in the early 19th century, turnips represent this new kind of agriculture, and they also represent hunger. But there's more. 
In addition to those meanings, when Turner painted this, turnips were also associated with the king. King George III had a deep interest in these new techniques. Sometimes people even called him Farmer George because he had a public interest in agriculture. He publicly advocated for these methods, and he publicly used these methods on his own land, particularly on the royal lands around Windsor. Turnips are just packed with meaning. So if we return to the painting, finally, and with all of this information in mind, we might notice that this is Windsor Castle in the background, and that adds a political element to this image. These workers participate in these fancy new farming techniques in the shadow of political authority. In fact, if we look right down the central axis of this painting, we see, starting in the foreground, some turnips in the ground. Slightly above that, we find some laborers attending to a broken plow, and moving up from that location, we have Windsor Castle. So there is a clear connection between turnips, the new agricultural practices that they represent, the state of the laboring class, and the king, or political authority generally. So new agriculture, new forms of labor, and the political authority that has overseen the transition to these new forms, it runs straight through the middle of this painting. Enclosure movements sped up during the 1760s because the government got involved. Parliament consistently affirmed the rights of landlords to hedge in these properties. So this shift in labor practices came from political authority, represented in this image by the castle. The laborers in this image did not decide for themselves to participate in this system. These are the people who were removed from that common land and became laborers on other people's land, selling their time for money. They've been removed from the decision-making process in order to make the land more productive. They're not involved in the negotiation anymore. And the land was more productive. There are plenty of cows in this image, with lots to eat, and by the records that we have, there was certainly a jump in English agricultural production during this time period. There kind of had to be. The Napoleonic Wars made it more difficult for England to import food from the continent, which put more of a burden on English land to produce the food, and so they did. We also see the effect of the Napoleonic Wars in the demographics of the laborers in this painting. Some of them appear on the older side, and Turner painted these two women clearly in the foreground, one of whom is nursing. And this calls attention to how badly England needed laborers while the men fought in the wars abroad, and how badly English households needed an extra income by having a new mother work in the fields. The land might be more productive, but the people working it? They're stretched pretty thin. So let's talk about the conditions of that laboring class here. Turner is doing something much different than we would usually see in a landscape painting of agricultural work during this time. I mean, just the decision to have this kind of scene feature turnips is pretty curious. It's not a particularly aesthetic production. Images of wheat fields or cornfields are beautiful, like this one by George Lambert. In an image like this, the focus is on the productivity of the land, like it is just producing loads of food and the laborers are there just to collect it. They live a leisurely life as the land does most of the work. This is an image of English land producing English food for English people. And that's not really happening in this image of turnip plowing. The focus here is much more on the humans who are producing the food. They're fixing plows and digging up root vegetables. It's an image of English laborers producing English food for English people and not in some sort of romantic way either. Turner's paintbrush isn't creating some idealized laboring class here. Like, compare Turner's workers to this image by George Stubbs. Here, the laborers look better prepared to go to a dinner party than field work. The work is easy and performed by beautiful people in clean clothes with new equipment on a perfect day. It almost looks like fun. Turner's field, on the other hand, looks cold. It's early in the morning. Mist is coming off the water. They're dressed for field work. They're nursing, fixing the plows. The focus here is on the reality of field labor. These workers are making the land productive. And at this moment, on this particular field, in this particular painting, the laborers are making the land productive for cows, who we see sampling the new harvest. As for the human food in this image, we have, in the foreground, a single bundle of food alongside a single bottle of ale. The land might be more productive in a general sense, 
But the presence of the nursing woman and this single bundle of food imply that this laboring class needs to stretch their resources. These households need to pull wages from both husband and wife, and as they labor, they need to make do with one bundle of food. Those other images of agricultural workers are creating a patriotic and self-sufficient narrative of English land producing plenty for the masses. They're creating a certain narrative that devalues, de-emphasizes, or maybe even romanticizes the human role in agricultural production. And as they do that, they also create a narrative that agricultural work is fun or quaint or otherwise satisfying. And this narrative, this trend in landscape painting to provide an idealized version of agricultural production, it participates in larger narratives that villainize the poor for being lazy. The land is doing most of the work here, and who wouldn't want this job? Looking at images like these, it would be easy to conclude that if somebody was poor or starving in England, it's because they chose a life of laziness. English land will provide enough food if you just show up to work wearing your Sunday best. To make this point more clear, take these images by George Moreland. This first one is called The Comforts of Industry, and you see this happy, healthy family who works hard. And then, in the second one, The Miseries of Idleness, we have a struggling family sitting around, gnawing on bones in ripped clothes and a baby crying. These images create a narrative that the poor people with ripped clothes are there because they didn't work hard enough. These prints allow landowners to feel better about having plenty while others have less. They're creating a narrative that allows those who have enough to moralize their success and attribute their comforts to virtue or goodness. These narratives imply a really simple, linear understanding of the world. They imply that English land, combined with English innovations, will provide anybody willing to work a good life and comfortable conditions. This implies that if your conditions are not comfortable, it's kind of your own fault. But Turner is playing a much more complicated game in these turnip fields. The narrative isn't so simple here. There is not a straight line between four crop rotation and comfortable living. Turner is more of a systems thinker. These workers have been displaced from their common land. There were political decisions made in places that don't represent them. There are foreign wars that have taken their fathers and husbands and brothers away from the field. There are broken plows and cold mornings with insufficient amounts of food. These are honest people who have to do this work because of diverse factors and causalities outside of their control. Enclosure movements, foreign wars, technological and agricultural innovations, and a host of other factors have all led them to this field, and they have very little choice in the matter. They don't want to eat turnips, but they're still fixing that plow. These characters exist outside the binary conditions created by George Moreland. It is not a simple equation of work equals comfort and idleness equals misery. There are political and environmental factors outside their control that have placed them on this field. A lot has happened for this collection of people to find themselves plowing turnips near Slough. Turner is showing us the impact of these societal shifts in this painting. Enclosures with their advanced farming techniques and turnips might produce more food, but they also create unequal social relationships and labor practices. Both those consequences can be true at the same time. More food and more wealth inequality. More wealth and less collaboration between equal members of a society. If we return to that train in rain, steam, and speed, we can see that it shows us how technological innovation can both be exciting and frightening, and that both are valid perspectives on that. This image of turnips shows us how there can be both more food and more hunger, and both are valid perspectives. This painting doesn't moralize the conditions of the poor in one way or the other. It doesn't flinch from the complicated causalities, but tries to illustrate that complexity. It shows the conditions of honest people who have been impacted by social systems beyond their control, just trying to plow up some turnips given the situation that they've been put in. This painting may not strike you the same way that Rain, Steam, and Speed does, but it certainly has something to say if you give it your attention. And I'm glad I did. And that's where I'll end this one. Thank you for watching my video about turnips. Please subscribe.